This, this is the most important electric guitar that has ever existed. Well, not this one. This one's a Michael Kelly. And whoever thought about putting a flame maple cap on a Telecaster should be fired. Also, what is going on with this headstock, man? It looks like a foot. I don't know. I think if you're trying to develop like a Telecaster copy, there's a few certain things that you but in all seriousness, this is one of those pieces of equipment that is so influential and so important that you wouldn't have modern music without it. It's kind of transcended its role as an instrument and transformed into a turning point in music and technology. There is before the Telecaster and there is after. But in order to truly understand the gravity of that statement, we need to take a step back and look at what guitars looked like before the Telecaster. And to do that, we need to go back to the 1910s ends. Honey, I need that first set piece. Now, most people will probably associate the first amplification of a guitar to somewhere in the 1930s or 40s. But in reality, nailing down the exact time that the electric guitar was invented is actually pretty hard. As early as the 1910s, musicians were putting phone transmitters inside of their instruments to achieve a louder sound. And several iterations of this kind of setup would start to show up between 1910 and 1930. But all of these were trying to achieve the same effect of making the guitar louder. An acoustic the guitar was fine in like a campfire setting, but in a 10 piece jazz band, the guitar was far from the star of the show. Without any amplification, guitarists were really regulated to be chordal rhythmic instruments. They were supporting lead lines by woodwinds or horns or vocalists. You guys know the deal, it's the 1930s. Trumpets. Your lips are water, your hair is softer, cut a dare say. So what you just heard was the new My Creator system from Austrian Audio. And I think what I just showed you is probably the best endorsement I could give for it, but let me tell you why this is an incredibly special USB mic. Because it's not actually just a USB mic. You can buy additional attachments for this microphone, such as the satellite. So in that video, we were able to record an acoustic guitar and also the vocal all through a single USB cable. It will show up as two independent signals in your DAW. So in that way, it functions like an audio interface because you can plug in an external input into this microphone. And the entire thing can fit in like a big pocket. It's crazy. This is why I love Austrian Audio, because they're not just going to make a USB microphone. They're going to make something that's different than anything else on the market. If you were to get the actual microphone, the satellite, and the lav mic, you essentially have three independent microphones and an audio interface. And all of that for less money than you'd pay for like a standard studio rig with one or two microphones. It's pretty cool. So thank you to Austrian Audio for sponsoring, and let's get back to the Telecaster. Even when more contemporary amplification and pickups started to emerge in the 1930s, these were for the most part fully hollow instruments, meaning they were completely hollow pieces of wood with a pickup sitting on top. And while this certainly helped the guitar to gain volume, we started to see a new issue develop, feedback. If the pickup would hear something coming out of the amplifier, it would pick that back up and send it right back to the amplifier, creating a feedback loop that sounds a little bit like this. Now, this is what I mean when I say the inventor of the electric guitar gets a little bit convoluted. Because following this issue of feedback, four different people tried to solve the problem. Les Paul, who you probably know, Leo Fender, who you probably know, and a duo named George Bouchamp and Adolf Rickenbacker, who you probably also know. Let's start with Les Paul, because along with being one of the most prolific audio inventors on the planet, here's a list of everything that he's made that's not an electric guitar, he also made this. Well, there's no easy way to say it. This is a train rail with a pickup on it, but it worked. People just thought it was ugly, understandably. So following this, he took a four by four slab of wood, stuck two panels from the carcass of a hollow body Epiphone onto the side of it to make him look less like a serial killer. And bam, no one ever knew, I think, probably. Talk about neck through design, am I right? Anyways, can you make sure you're subscribed? Les Paul called this guitar the log and it would become the foundation that would lead to the Les Paul guitar. But the Les Paul guitar didn't make it onto the market before the Telecaster. In fact, whenever Les Paul brought up the idea to Gibson, they said no until the Telecaster got successful. When Paul went to them with one of his early efforts, Gibson ridiculed him. I took it to Gibson and Gibson said uh, that I was the weirdo 
with the broomstick with the pickups on it. Ten years later, after Leo Fender and, and, and many of the other people around the world that were interested in guitar saw this thing, they saw the possibilities much more than Gibson did. So if you want to count the log as the first electric guitar ever, be my guest. But there's a couple others that may have you question that. So let's check in on George Bouchamp and Adolf Rickenbacker. Because in 1932, way before Les Paul, they've just made this, which is technically the first solid body electric guitar. But it's a lap steel guitar. And it is old. Why do they call it a frying pan? Look at it. You could cook an egg on it. <laughs> now this might seem like a weird stop along the story of the Telecaster, but this instrument had more influence on the Telecaster than any other instrument before. And that's primarily due to the pickups, copper coils wrapped around a magnet, or in other words, a primitive version of the exact design that we still use today. So when Leo Fender and George Fullerton set out to make their own solid body instrument, they took direct inspiration from this lap steel design. And then in 1949, something beautiful was born. It wasn't the Telecaster though. Sure did look like one though. It had the classic Tele body, but it had one pickup, it had a lap steel guitar neck, and it had a different kind of pick guard as well. But let's just fast forward one more year and I bet we'll be there. Hmm, this is not a Telecaster either. This one's called an Esquire. And in 1950, only 50 of them were made, which for the most part is due to a pretty big design flaw. A lot of them were returned and that's because they didn't have a truss rod inside of the neck. So that neck would snap or bend or warp and become unplayable. So let's just fast forward a, a, just a few months more. And now the Broadcaster. It looks like a Telecaster though. They chose Broadcaster quite obviously because it's loud, it broadcasts, but Gretsch already had a drum kit with the same name. Gretsch threatened to sue them and they had to, they had to take it down. So for one year after this, the Telecaster didn't have a name. It was just the Fender guitar. They've colloquially become the Nocasters. And then in 1950, 51, the Telecaster was actually named the Telecaster due to the emerging popularity of television. The Esquire family also got a truss rod and was sold as a cheaper alternative to the Telecaster. Now there are a ton of different ways that you can rack up the Telecaster as a success. But before diving into the musical influence that the Telecaster had, I wanted to talk about its design and manufacturing, just real quick, just let me do it. Cause they did something right that no other manufacturer was doing at the time. They designed, assembled, and produced these instruments under the modular design principles of Henry Ford. While other instruments were handcrafted using really intricate joinery that required a lot of hand carving and hand craftsmanship, Leo attached the neck of those guitars with four bolts, man. A quick look under the pick guard, which you could take off with some screws, that shows you all of the internal electronics inside of the Telecaster. And a bridge design that functionally worked as a shield for the pickup and also gave an incredibly iconic bright tone, so much so that they patented it. Leo never even envisioned refretting an instrument. In his mind, you could just swap out the neck. So this ease of production quickly allowed Fender to scale from a small workshop to a massive corporation in not that long of time. Now, throughout this whole process that I've been describing, Leo Fender and George Fullerton have been bringing the Telecaster to live shows. The goal was to urge blossoming country and Western artists to use this in live settings to project their sound, and it worked. Artists like Waylon Jennings and James Burton were among the first of the country Western scene to adopt this guitar. And before long, the instrument became synonymous with country and Western music and still is to this day. The bright, crispy sound of that bridge pickup allowed it to cut through in a band and set it, making it so lead and melodic lines were much more doable on a guitar than they had ever been in the past. The guitar was no longer relegated to be a rhythmic instrument. It could be both. It wasn't long before blues players started jumping on board too, like Muddy Waters and B.B. King, and their use of the Telecaster would later influence artists like Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, and later even like Bruce Springsteen. This ripple effect influenced others to pick up the solid body electric guitar as well. And before long, people were starting to notice how well 
the electric guitar took to loud, gritty tones. It's really not a coincidence that in our kind of collective cultural mind, we encapsulate the 1900s to the early 50s as the old stuff and late 1950s all the way up to the 90s as at least a little more contemporary and modern, right? Like Buddy Holly, Muddy Waters, Chuck Berry, they lead to Keith Richards and Jimmy Page, which leads to Van Halen, which pisses Kurt Cobain off, so he makes Nirvana, and so on. It all starts with the electrification of the guitar, and then even further, how the electric guitar led to a control over volume, dirt, and feedback. See, while the Telecaster's mission of solving volume and feedback had more or less been accomplished, that left the creative expression of that volume in the hands of the players. Enter Jimmy Page, and he brought a song with him. That song is called Rumble by Link Ray and the Raymen, and in 1958, it became the first widespread use of distortion in a popular song. Audience found this instrumental track to be so captivating that they asked for it multiple times in the same live show. They would ask for it four times in a row. Now this track directly inspired a young Jimmy Page to explore more aggressive experimental sounds. And that led to his work in the Yardbirds and of course later Led Zeppelin. All the while he was recording most of his material on a Fender Telecaster, even Stairway to Heaven. That solo is a Fender Telecaster, even though we associate the Les Paul with what he's done, in the studio, most of the tracks were cut on a Fender Telecaster. Now, throughout all of this, like I already mentioned, Fender is growing like crazy. They're no longer a small shop out of California. They are a full-blown, massive company. And due to health concerns, Leo Fender decides to step down and sell the company to CBS in January 5th, 1965. CBS presents this program in color. Now, the general consensus is around this time period, quality begins to fall. The logo is changed to a more television-friendly font. The tuners are changed. The pickup selector layout is changed to a more conventional one. All custom colors are discontinued and the final nail in the coffin, they replaced the finish of the guitar with a polyurethane, which is basically a thick coat of plastic that gives it a really shiny candy look. It's cheaper, it's faster, but it's not all bad like many of you might believe. The Telecaster saw its first use of a humbucker inside of the instrument during the CBS era. And they also expanded the lines into several different models like the Telecaster Custom, the Telecaster Thin Line, the Telecaster Deluxe. Although like I mentioned, before many noted a general degradation in quality, yet those 70 tele prices are still insanely expensive and going up on reverse. What are you doing? If they're bad instruments, stop buying them because I would like to own a vintage Fender in my life. So stop, <laughs> stop buying them. Now, CBS would eventually sell Fender in the 1980s. And although there's plenty to cover between 1990 and 2020, I only have so much time and I really want to talk about just how prominent the Telecaster still is in modern day. In nearly every country band, they're pretty much required. Midwest emo bands have kind of adopted the guitar as like the sad boy mascot. Like don't show a sad boy from Ohio a white Telecaster with a black pit guard. He will get addicted to nicotine and Polaroid cameras. And even in some contemporary math rock bands, the Telecaster is preferred over the more traditional heavy humbucker sound. While companies like Rickenbacker and Gibson might have been at the cutting edge during the start, Fender is the only one of the companies that is still here and still at the cutting edge, all while gracing each period of music that came before now. It's the guitar that won't die because it started it all in the first place. It's like if Jordan beat LeBron 40 years ago and is still beating LeBron 40 years later. I don't know, man. I don't watch sports. I don't even know why I wrote that the script. Moving on. All of that with virtually zero changes to the fundamental design. It's insane and a testament to just how good of an instrument this is. It started it all and it's still out here killing it today. You just, you gotta love it, dude. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed. If you did, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. All that just for the algorithm more than anything to, you know, push this thing up. And uh, thank you so much. I will catch you around later. Bye-bye.